right, just by way of review, um, the way you can, we can think about pancreatic cancer, not necessarily in the TNM staging system, but simply as localized, located, locally advanced, unresectable, or metastatic disease. Unfortunately, the last two categories really comprise the vast majority of, of patients. And I'll spend most of my remarks talking about the, the metastatic disease setting. You could potentially subsume the locally advanced uh, into metastatic disease in terms of our thoughts in, as far as systemic therapy. Uh, goes. And then there's really this increasingly uh, recognized category of borderline resectable uh, tumors. And that's what we used to lump together with locally advanced unresectable disease. But now we're coming to realize that there are unique patients who, um, based on perhaps just um, uh, partial involvement of the SMV or SMA or even uh, uh, complete occlusion of the SMV portal confluence, for example, may be resectable with uh, optimal cytoreductive therapy. And that even op offers a window of opportunity to study some uh, new drugs in terms of looking at on-target effects. But we'll, we'll spend most of the time talking about the, the most common scenario of um, uh, patients with uh, advanced and metastatic disease. This is just by way of review. I'm not going to go over the old data as far as gemcitabine. I think everyone in this audience is familiar and has used uh, that uh, quite a lot um, over the past 15, 20 years. So you see a relatively small number of uh, sort of milestones in terms of therapeutic drug development. Our lot number approved in 2005. I'm not sure many in the audience are using that anymore. I certainly uh, don't in my practice. Uh, and then we've had a couple of uh, positive uh, results that I'll just go over briefly. Um, in terms of fulfurinox and gemcitabine nap, uh, paclitaxel. But what we had for a number of years really was a, was a number of negative phase three results. And these were primarily using the, the paradigm of looking at gemcitabine versus gemcitabine plus your drug of interest. Maybe it was a platinum analog, a fluoroprimidine, targeted therapies, and by and large, with the exception of uh, uh, erlotinib with a questionable uh, benefit, um, these were really negative studies. And I just highlight some of these uh, here. Um, we, for better or for worse, we did choose to use these combinations because on meta-analyses, you could find that at least in good performance status patients, there seemed to be some benefit derived with using doublet therapy, but really not a great weight of evidence in terms of positive phase three data. Now I highlight in red just, in, in, I'm trying to get out of the habit of looking at just median survivals. Um, because I think hazard ratio probably is a more accurate reflection of the efficacy of a particular drug or drug combination. Uh, that being said, uh, the, the, the common data that we think of in terms of the gemerlotinib uh, combination is that 0.4 month or, or 12 day improvement in median survival that was pretty underwhelming to most folks, uh, myself included. And this was just the uh, Kaplan-Meier survival, survival curse, which believe it or not was representative of a positive result. Now, over the past few years, thankfully, we have had a couple of new um, uh, regimens that have become the standard of care uh, for patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer. Um, the French data um, uh, from the Prodigia Accord uh, trial that was published a few years back in the New England Journal of Medicine compared patients um, who had metastatic disease uh, receiving either gemcitabine, standard way we have given all along, versus fulfirinox, or the combination of infusional and bolus 5-FU, oxaliplatin, arentican, uh, leucovorin. And this study really uh, uh, demonstrated, I think, a proof of principle in terms of a non-gemcitabine-based regimen. And, and I do want to highlight in terms of the demographics of this patient population, because I think this is important. Um, this really was a much fitter uh, patient population, ECOG-0, 1, so not your sort of frail elderly patient. Uh, I think it's also been uh, critiqued uh, quite extensively the fact that a majority of patients uh, that were enrolled had disease that was located in the body and tail of the pancreas as opposed to the head. So they weren't necessarily running into issues with biliary stents and the concomitant problems as far as uh, ascending cholangitis and occlusion and biliary sepsis. Um, so there's even been some controversy in terms of whether this uh, regimen is suitable for patients with pancreatic head tumors who have indwelling stents, although I and, and most of my colleagues do use that still in, in that situation because the majority of patients, frankly, that we see have cancers that arise in the uh, head of the pancreas. Cutting to the chase, if you look at the efficacy results of fulfurinox, you see that, say, unlike the gem or lotinum data, the, the, the survival curves here really meet that eyeball test from the back of the room, right? I mean, these are survival curves that really separate out uh, and really uh, you can see that separation out to, out to two or even uh, uh, two and a half years or so. 
The response rate is much higher, and so, again, I'm not going to diverge too much in terms of talking about borderline resectable disease, but fulfirinox is a, a regimen that I, I'm now using increasingly um, in that setting where we want to cite or reduce patients to get them ideally to an R0 resection. And we have been seeing some very impressive pathologic, sometimes even near complete pathologic responses with this multi-drug regimen. And I think it's particularly noteworthy that the median survival, okay, this is metastatic disease. So this isn't lumping together patients with locally advanced and metastatic together where the locally advanced sort of skews the survival results better. So metastatic only cohort, granted better performance status, hitting almost one year in terms of survival. That's really not been seen in any uh, previous study. And that really led to this uh, regimen as being adopted um, as the gold standard for at least your fitter, uh, more robust patients. I'll say this study limited uh, age up to 75. Uh, sometimes I will push the envelope a little beyond that uh, as well. The safety toxicity profiles are, as you might uh, expect, with a combination regimen, the neuropathy associated with uh, oxaliplatin and the cytopenias. This study didn't mandate um, uh, prophylactic growth factor support, although per routine I do use uh, Nuasta uh, routinely in uh, patients right from the get-go, uh, given the high rates of hematologic toxicity. The second trial worth noting is the uh, so-called IMPACT trial. Now, unlike the Fulfirinox trial, this was a much more global study, so conducted in university settings, in, in community settings, throughout uh, the Americas, in Europe, and Asia, so really all over, so perhaps more reflective of a, of a real-world population, and considerably bigger. Um, almost 900 patients enrolled to this study. Uh, it did include uh, some locally advanced, but it was primarily a metastatic uh, population. Uh, and these individuals were randomized to get either gemcitabine or the combination of gemcitabine plus nabpaclitaxel, okay? And the dose you see here, the nabpaclitaxel is at 125 milligrams per meter squared. And perhaps, so again, a significant result, perhaps more modest uh, than the, than the Falfirinox uh, results, again, recognizing the differences in, in study populations. Um, but a hazard ratio of about 0.7 with an improvement in median survival by about 1.8 months or so. So 8.5 months for this uh, patient population with a combination of GEM and nabpaclitaxel. Again, with improvements in PFS and response rate. And again, if you look at the safety and toxicity of results with the gemcitabine nabpaclitaxel combination, nabpaclitaxel is not a particularly emetogenic drug, um, but really quite a uh, high rate of cytopenias as well. The fatigue, the neuropathy, which uh, one might argue uh, is more reversible than platinum-associated um, peripheral nerve damage. So I always like to uh, show this slide in terms of a comparison. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get a head-to-head -head comparison between these two drugs. Uh, I don't think the, 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 the companies are going to be interested in doing that. There's been discussion in the cooperative groups, but whether that's really an appropriate uh, mechanism to do what would amount to be a thousand patient study, that would be, it would be practical, but um, uh, I'm just not sure that that's ever really going to be um, uh, uh, performed. So you can see, again, the differences, and um, a couple things I'll note is that the Falfirinox study did embed some pretty valuable quality of life data, and this is something I do discuss with uh, my patients who are worried about the toxicities of a multi-drug regimen and a port and a pump and things, and that's the fact that the time to deterioration in performance status was actually prolonged with Falfirinox. Either quality of life was better for a longer period of time, presumably because um, their disease was better controlled for a longer period of time, and that actually uh, overwhelmed the toxicities associated with treatment. Um, we didn't have similar quality of life data for the uh, IMPACT uh, trial. Um, the, there was a lot of uh, thought and discussion about whether uh, SPARC um, might have represented a potential biomarker, a predictive biomarker, whether in the tumor cells themselves or potentially in the stroma um, that, uh, that could predict for sensitivity to nabpaclitaxel that was suggested in the phase one, two study and in some of the animal studies. It turns out that uh, they reported uh, these data from the IMPACT trial uh, in the European meal last year, and it doesn't turn out to be quite the, the biomarker we had hoped for. So unfortunately, in terms of biomarkers um, and, and looking for something that helps guide us in decision-making in pancreatic cancer, we're, st we're still really in the dark ages compared to 
uh, compared to lung cancer, breast cancer, others. Uh, and, and our decision in terms of which of these regimens to use is going to be more informed by patient characteristics, performance status, comor comorbid conditions, et cetera. OK, so uh, the title of this talk is, is First, Second, and Third Line Treatments in Pancreatic Cancer. And, and so this is really a welcome new problem in terms of can we really start sequencing treatments for metastatic disease? In, in the past, this is not something we'd really think of. It was sort of window of opportunity, first line treatment. The majority of folks after that, maybe we'd get them on a clinical trial, or uh, maybe we'd really just refer them to, uh, to palliative and hospice care. Um, and about half of patients traditionally have been at least well enough to think about this question of, of sequencing. Um, I'd say that number is probably increasing now. Um, recognizing uh, a referral bias pattern, I, I'd say that probably two-thirds to three-quarters of uh, patients that I see um, who progress on first-line treatment are going to be eligible for treatment beyond that. Um, and so we can start thinking along these lines of second, even third line uh, treatment and beyond. Now, this is a take home message and this is to remind myself and everyone here that even though we have these, all these expanding array of, of options and different chemotherapies, there is not an established standard of care for patients post first line treatment. Okay, and as I mentioned before, we don't have any validated biomarkers that helps guide us in this decision making uh, process. Now, what, what have we had in terms of second-line data up to this point? Well, we had this, this bandied about CONCA-03 trial from Germany that was first reported about eight years ago and only was just published uh, last year that looked at this so-called OFF regimen. Um, basically, it's a different way of giving infusional 5-FU and oxalic plant. So think of it more or less as a fall fox type regimen. And at least this study suggested, all right, well, compared to, say, just 5-FU, um, in patients who had received previous gemcitabine, it seemed to be better, and so de facto this became our standard of care. Now the caveat is that the first line treatment for this study was just patients who had gotten gemcitabine monotherapy. Okay, and then last year at uh, the ASCO annual meeting, there was a study that was almost as large in size, and this was called the Pancreox study out of Canada, and quite surprisingly and conversely to the previous study, the addition of oxaliplatin to fluoroperimidine, so a fall fox regimen like we typically give it, showed absolutely no benefit. In fact, if anything, uh, there was a statistical um, uh, advantage to giving just uh, five of ulugovorin. And so, again, this highlights the fact that, okay, maybe we think that more is better in this context, but who knows? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And I just highlight here a few other relatively smaller studies of chemotherapy regimens in the salvage setting. Uh, using oxaliplatin or irinotecan-based regimens. And you can see all of these are in, again, these are generally single arm, non-randomized studies, so you're already biasing for patients who are well enough to get second line treatment. You're seeing this median progression-free survival about three months and a survival in the range of six months or so uh, in this sort of pre-selected patient population. Okay, so this is, I'll bet many in this audience have a pretty similar uh, approach and, and I show you here kind of what I do, and I wish I could say this was backed by more weighty evidence. But if someone starts on, say, Gemnab Paclitaxel, at the point of progression, I'm still using an oxali based regimen, uh, Falfox, Kpox, and then possibly switching to an irinotecan based regimen, third line. Acknowledging that there's actually some data for uh, Falfiri in the salvage setting and for Gem pre treated metastatic pancreatic cancer. Now, if you start with Falfirinox, the logical uh, progression is to switch to Gemnab, Paclitaxel. Second line, again, emphasizing we don't have a lot of data to say that that's the right thing to do. We do it because we, we extrapolate from first line data. Um, and then beyond that, when they've already received basically all active chemotherapy agents, uh, at that point, we sort of are left with saying, all right, let's look at clinical trials and uh, maybe we'll do some foundation medicine profiling, et cetera. Um, so I, I want to present a little bit of newer data that you uh, may be familiar with, or this hasn't, hasn't been published yet, but this is something that I think it should be on your radar screens because it may change practice. Uh, this is the Napoli-1 trial. Um, this was for patients with metastatic pancreas cancer, previous gemcitabine, and this study randomized patients second line to get either MM398, and I'll tell you what this drug is, um, 
just five of you leucovorin, or the combination of MM398, five of you, and leucovorin. Now, MM398 is basically a novel formulation of irinotecan. It's basically encapsulated in this nanoliposome. It has better biodistribution, um, uh, less free drug sort of uh, in circulation, so ostensibly less toxicity. Um, I had the opportunity to lead the phase two study of this in this uh, study, and, and basically I'd say that you have the toxicities you'd expect with irinotecan. Actually, not too much in terms of bad diarrhea, but just asthenia, cytopenias, uh, et cetera. But it was enough to uh, go ahead with this big international phase three trial, and the results they presented uh, at last year's um, ESMO meeting actually showed that it, it met its uh, endpoint, and that's that, again, I think the study was pretty savvy in terms of looking at that combination arm of 5-FU, leucovorin, MM398, which I think most in the audience will recognize is, is kind of a riff on full theory. Okay, um, but that combination compared to just 5-FU leucovorin by itself actually was uh, associated with significant improvements in overall survival and PFS as shown by these um, survival curves. So the survival difference was 6.1 versus 4.2 months for overall survival and uh, higher response rates as well. So currently, if this is under review for FDA approval. Um, and I think we'd, we'd all agree that this is probably um, only going to be used post a gemcitabine-based uh, regimen. So someone post fulfurinox, I'm not sure it would make sense to go back and use this MM398. Now, I, I think people can raise the question of, well, how much better is this really going to be than fulfuri? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if that study will ever be conducted. My guess is probably not. Um, but I, I think this will emerge as a new standard of care um, second-line treatment, for example, post-gemcitabine nab paclitaxel. And we won't have the discussion about value and pricing and where they might uh, uh, price that, but I think these uh, considerations also may come, in, uh, come into play. Now, in my last few minutes, I just want to go a little bit and tell you about some, uh, a few targeted therapies that should be on your radar screen, because these are fairly far along in clinical development. If they're positive, which is a big if, um, they may ultimately lead to uh, additional indications in this second, third line space. So I just show here a, a number of uh, studies. Uh, I led a few of them, and I'm sort of the king of negative studies, sadly. Um, which is perhaps to be expected when you, you spend a lot of time um, uh, studying pancreatic cancer. But really, all of these, if anything, are more dismal than chemotherapy. So these targeted agents re ranging from EGFR inhibitors, VEGF inhibitors, um, mTOR inhibitors, et cetera, um, uh, MAP kinase inhibitors, they've, they've just really been pretty disappointing by and large. Uh, the one that got a fair amount of attention at last year's ASCO meeting and has led to a couple uh, pivotal, what are intended to be pivotal uh, in registrational studies, is the use of ruxolitinib, which the audience might recognize as a drug they use um, in the context of uh, uh, myelofibrosis. Uh, and the concept here is that the, the, the symptoms we think of as associated with pancreatic cancer, the cachexia and inanition and weight loss and these things, may be at least in part, if not a majority, due to the systemic inflammatory component that is uh, uh, that develops uh, in the context of uh, advanced disease. And so specifically for patients with sort of high uh, systemic inflammation as reflected in, um, here's this sort of uh, evasive, elusive biomarker here, this C-reactive protein, which is basically not that specific, and it's a, just a serum-based marker, but for patients with high levels of C-reactive protein, um, this uh, study showed that, the, that using ruxolitinib in addition to capecitabine for patients after gemcitabine did uh, improve patient outcomes. And I'll just show you the results here. The entire study population, not a very a, a big difference. But if you looked again at the pre-planned um, analysis of patients with that high level of C-reactive protein. So again, that, that uh, systemic inflammation, so uh, a lot more wasting and, and cachexia you can see actually pretty imp uh, impressive improvement in terms of uh, a hazard ratio of actually less than 0 0.5. So there are a couple of ongoing trials called Janus 1 and 2 that are intended to look at this in the second line setting, post-gemcitabine-based treatment, capecitabine versus capecitabine plus ruxolinib, specifically in that enriched patient population of CRP, C-reactive protein, high uh, levels. 
Um, and so stay tuned. This, these studies really are just uh, recently underway. Okay, last thing I want to uh, mention in, in the last minute or so I have is immunotherapy, obviously on everyone's mind. We know it's huge in melanoma. It's gaining traction in lung cancer, bladder, other, other types. Pancreatic cancer, not really thought to be as immunogenic a malignancy. If you go and look at pancreatic tumors, you don't see that sort of robust infiltrative T cell uh, component in there. But it turns out, and we're not going to talk about immune checkpoint in here, because I'm sure you're going to hear plenty about that in other sessions if you haven't already, but even these are starting to gain a little bit of uh, interest as combination therapy in, in pancreatic cancer. But probably uh, the furthest along in, in development is this uh, concept of using um, uh, a vaccine. And in this case, um, this is um, a vaccine that's a genetically modified Listeria, okay? And basically, the the virulence genes are removed from it. A mesothelin cassette is um, uh, placed in it so that uh, the body's immune system in response to um, infusion with this uh, vaccine is to mount a T cell response that recognizes mesothelin, which happens to be expressed in upwards of 90% of pancreatic cancers. So the previous phase two study of this actually showed that this uh, Listeria vaccine, also called CRS-207, in combination with GVAX, which is just a, a cellular vaccine, um, for heavily pretreated patients, uh, compared to just the GVAX alone, had a pretty impressive uh, uh, impact in terms of survival. And, and this was just published uh, earlier this year in the JCO. And you can see, again, the blue curves uh, highlight the, the CRS-207 uh, GVAX combination. And you're hit, hitting a median survival uh, in this um, admittedly pre-selected uh, population of close to 10 months. So there's, there's clearly some there there uh, that justified going forward with this study, um, which is called the Eclipse trial. It's recruiting right now. And this may actually, if it's positive, um, uh, go forward in, in terms of uh, seeking approval for this um, uh, vaccine for use in the chemo refractory setting um, for metastatic pancreatic cancer. So again, stay tuned uh, uh, for this um, because we should probably uh, hear results in, in the not too distant future. Okay, so this is my last slide and this is just to show uh, what I demonstrated before in terms of where we're at with sequencing uh, treatments. I put MF398 uh, there because I think this very well might be um, uh, part of our treatment paradigms in, uh, in the coming months, um, uh, post gemcidine uh, nab paclitaxel. But I also just show that um, there's really a, a number of other um, uh, possibilities uh, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of treatment, in addition to the ones I've shown, a number of other uh, investigational agents that are really especially being used, not just in the frontline setting, but, look, but looking at it in that second line setting, in the third line setting, uh, and beyond. Um, so I think there's reason for uh, optimism. So after all these years of kind of nihilism and, and disappointment, uh, I think we're finally uh, making some headway in this disease. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention.